economic progress. So it's a pleasure today to have uh, with us Professor Martin Biro from the University of Oxford, of the Department of Physics of the University of Oxford. Uh, people working in the field of galaxies uh, know the name at least. Uh, Martin's research uh, is on the formation and evolution of galaxies. Uh, he is studying usually nearby galaxies. And uh, he's many years now in Oxford before he was uh, at the uh, was NASA Hubble Fellow at the Department of Astronomy at the Columbia University in New York. Uh, he was another postdoc, was previously to the Leiden Observatory. Uh, his PhD was at Mount Stromlo in Australia, and he, his uh, uh, undergraduate studies uh, were in the Department of Montreal in Canada, where he is originated. We are very glad uh, that uh, you are with us uh, today, Martin, and we thank you very much for giving us the talk. You see already the title you have in the uh, announcement, Waiting, Weighing the Invisible, and we are listening to your talk. Thank you, Panos. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, today, even if uh, virtually. Uh, it's actually quite practical in all honesty. So it's a pleasure for me to be here and tell you a little bit about the project that is called Wisdom. And as you can see on the first slide, uh, Wisdom does exactly what it says on the tin, which is it actually aims to weigh uh, essentially the, the objects that we now know to alert. Uh, at the centers of galaxies. So WISDOM stands for Millimeter Wave Interferometric Survey of Dark Object Masses. And so it attempts to measure dark objects, i.e. Uh, black holes, using millimeter wave interferometry, which in practice means the telescope called ALMA, which I'll tell you a little bit more later. So um, the WISDOM team has all of the people listed here. Uh, I'm co-leading this team with Tim Davis, who's at the University of Cardiff. And all the people in gold are actually working on these efforts to measure the masses of supermassive black holes. Uh, the people who are in white are working on an entirely different part of the project, which has to do with probing the spatially resolved properties of giant molecular clouds. And both of these use actually exactly the same data sets, and I'll illustrate that a little bit later. So before uh, I start really telling you about the project, I would like to give you an introduction to situate this in the context of contemporary astrophysics and explain a little bit why we think it's important to go and measure those supermassive black hole masses. Uh, I will then take some time to explain to you why it's actually quite difficult to do this, right? We think of black holes as having, you know, being very, very massive, having important effect on galaxies, but it's actually quite hard to really weigh them, so measure them properly. And then I'll, I'll show you a bunch of examples of what we do in practice. So um, if anything is unclear, of course, do feel free to, uh, to interrupt. Uh, here we go, introduction. So I start literally all my talks myself with this one slide, which is what we call the Hubble sequence. And it's nothing more, nothing less than just a sequence of galaxies that are arranged by essentially their morphologies, right? So this is a morphological sequence. On the left here, you have the so-called early type galaxies. So the elliptical galaxies that, as the name suggests, or essentially three-dimensional spheroids, right? So they're, so they're kind of football-shaped or American football-shaped, cigar-shaped, if you want, galaxies uh, that are supported against gravity by random motions, largely. And you can see from their colors, they're very red, which suggests that they're very old because we know that red means cool, right, in physics. And uh, cool stars are typically very old. The young stars that are very hot don't live very long. So these galaxies on the left here, or actually also the most massive galaxies. So they're presumably the end state of galaxy evolution. On the right, we have the late type galaxies, primarily the spirals. And you can see here, if I could show them to you in three dimensions, that they're a little bit like an old record, right? So they're very flat, uh, but round seen face on, and they're supported against gravity by rotation. And you can see from their colors that they have uh, blue colors and therefore lots of young, massive stars. So these stars don't live very young, very long, sorry. So they must be young. So we think of this a bit as a, I mean, it's a morphological sequence, but it's probably also a kind of growth or evolutionary sequence whereby the galaxies on the right are less massive and they evolve presumably over time towards the galaxies on the left. As they do so, they must not only change their shape, so their dynamics, uh, but the stars also must evolve. And somehow we need to quench the formation of stars in the most massive ones because they're always red. 
And that's going to be a driver for the work today. Um, so we must understand this evolution of galaxies really in a cosmological context, that is within the context of the evolution of our entire universe, right? Essentially the, the Big Bang cosmology. Oop, apologies. And so we have the Hubble sequence here that is really the end point of galaxy evolution. And we know that it must start with essentially the faintest galaxies that we see in very deep surveys of the universe. This is the old, uh, Hubble uh, deep field. I guess I could put now uh, images from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, but the important thing is we now know that at intermediate redshift, so at kind of cosmic noon, when the universe was only half of its age, the galaxies that we see are extremely gas-rich and turbulent. So they're quite different from the galaxies that we see today that are clearly dominated by stars. So when the universe was only about half of its present age, galaxies were very, very gas-rich and very turbulent. So you must find a way to go from these very, very high redshift galaxies, the farthest objects currently seen by the James Webb Space Telescope, to the galaxies today via this kind of gas-rich epoch. And we think that the way that we shut the star formation, so how we prevent this gas here from forming stars, is through the effect of black hole. And what I'll call black hole, often you'll hear the term active galactic nucleus feedback. So that is, if these black holes accrete material, they become active, you know, they might uh, create jets that then push and heat up the gas and prevent it from forming stars. So another very simple way to see the scenario, if you want, in our head is to look at what is nothing more, nothing less than the color magnitude diagram of galaxies. So we plot magnitude or brightness on the x-axis, color, uh, which is a proxy for age on the y-axis, and we see that essentially all the galaxies that were on the right, what I call the late types of the spirals, live in a blue cloud. All the galaxies that were on the left, uh, the ellipticals, the early types live in a red sequence. And the key for this plot is that there's very little in between. Okay, this green valley is called a valley because there's not much in it. And that is key because if the spiral galaxies were to evolve slowly to become ellipticals, so as you move from the blue cloud to the red sequence, if you were to consume your gas slowly, uh, you should migrate from the blue cloud to the red sequence, you know, more or less uh, uniformly, so gradually, and they should be full of galaxies in between. So the fact that we have a valley here, that very few objects, tells us that this project must be very quick, much quicker than the normal rate at which stars are consumed, at which gas is consumed, pardon me. So um, essentially what I'm saying is that the most massive galaxies, the galaxies on the right here, are all red, right? There are no blue massive galaxies. And you know the solution to this, we think, is a black hole or AGN feedback. So what you see here in the top left is this cosmological context that I talked about is how we think galaxies evolve over time. So small blobs make big blobs, big blobs make gigantic blobs, gigantic blobs make you know, humongous blobs, and at some point we call this a galaxy. But here, the only thing that you saw on the top left is really the accumulation of, of mass of stellar mass. So we don't see the impact of the black holes on the gas. So what I'm going to show now in the bottom uh, right is essentially the same movie, but now we're going to focus on what happens to the gas. And you're going to see that where this, the galaxies form, you get these explosive-like events that essentially have two roles. They eject, literally eject mechanically, gas from the center of the galaxies, but they also heat it up. In fact, the color here is temperature. Red is, is high temperature. So you can see that they can, you know, the, the, the feedback from the black holes can prevent stars from forming in two ways, both by removing gas physically from the galaxies or by heating it up and therefore preventing it from collapsing uh, gravitationally. And so really these two movies are very, very different. And we see the tremendous impact that the black holes have on galaxy evolution. Now, clearly these are models, right? This is not necessarily the truth. And that's why we need to go and test, right? These models only work uh, if you get these supermassive black holes in the center of every galaxy. And it's, you could say it's almost like a, a prediction of this theory. Now we've known already for about 20 years that most galaxies in fact harbor black holes. And there is a rough relationship between the black hole masses here on the y-axis and the mass of the galaxy itself, or at least of the spheroidal part in the middle, what we would call the bulge. So the bigger the galaxy, the bigger the black hole. 
Uh, and you can see here in the top right, a kind of artist impression of what happens around these active galactic nuclei. So you have a black hole in the middle, uh, an accretion disk around it, and somehow magically these jets are created uh, and, and are pushing out at with you know material electrons close to the speed of light. Um, and here's a real multi-wavelength picture of a nearby active galactic nucleus to us. So whoop, here, I'm not showing you the stars, I'm showing you always the gas. So, um, you know, there's a galaxy here in the middle, there's a black hole, you see the jets coming out and you see them plowing uh, through the, in this case, both the interstellar and then later on the intergalactic medium and creating these typical bow shocks. Uh, and you can see what I said before, the gas, the, the jets pushing on the gas and heating it up. Now, this is in a sense, the state of the art of this relationship between galaxy mass and black hole mass that I talked about before. Uh, the best proxy for uh, galaxy mass is generally uh, the velocity dispersion of the stars, which is kind of a proxy, if you want, for the depth of the potential well in which the stars live. So the x-axis here you can take as galaxy mass and the y-axis in the black hole mass. And all of what you see here uh, or, or, or measurements of these black hole masses built over a period of 20, 25 years. And they're only of order, maybe a hundred high quality measurements. Many other people, of course, then use this relation. And instead of measuring the black hole mass, they would measure the quantity on the, on the x-axis and infer, assuming that the relation is right, the black hole mass. But actual measurements are quite uh, far and few between. And in fact, if you look here at the error bars, you'll see that the error bars or typically of order 100%, you know, certainly several tens of percent, right? You can see the answer here would be, you know, two times 10 to the eight plus or minus one kind of thing, right? Or, you know, it's kind of five plus or minus two, uh, something like that. Uh, and I'll come back to this later because what I'll show is that the method I'll be promoting today uh, will reduce these error bars by one or two orders of magnitude. Um, what I haven't said as well is most of the masses in this plot were measured using essentially only three different methods. The first one is stellar kinematics, so really the motion of the stars. Uh, and this has been used mostly at the high mass end, so on the right side of this plot, where the elliptical galaxies live. Uh, people have used ionized gas, uh, also the dynamics, and that's been used mostly for spiral galaxies, so the galaxies that were on the right in this plot. And then at the lowest masses, we have the mazes. Uh, so this is by far the most accurate method. And if you look at the triangles here, you'll see that the air bars in the y direction are much, much smaller. Often they're invisible. These are um, mazes, so uh, objects that emit most of their light in a single line, very close to the black hole. So they're very good probes of the masses of the kinematics in the black holes. However, what you will notice if you look only at the triangle, is that they do not follow the relation defined by all of the worst measurements, right? So we have a lot, a lot of measurements using stellar and gas kinematics that define this relation. And that's our, our kind of our gold standards. The best measurements that we have all lie in a fairly narrow mass range, and they do not follow the relation defined by the rest of the uh, measurements. So this is very worrying, right? So really, if we want to improve this situation, what we want is a method that is valid across the entire mass range, right? So that if you have any biases, at least it's the same one everywhere. The method should be uh, reliable in the sense robust, and it should be quick, right? And I will argue that the method I'll talk about today, which uses molecular gas, fulfills all of these criteria. So it's unique in the sense that we can apply it across all the masses, all galaxy type. It's conceptually simple. It's literally high school physics, as I'll show in a second. And it's easily scalable. We can literally make measurements in minutes of observing time uh, with the ALMA telescope. Uh, maybe let me skip this plot. So now, um, if that is clear, if the background of why we need uh, more measurements uh, is clear, I'll move on and say why these measurements are actually difficult. Why did it take 25 years to build, you know, 100, maybe 200, if you're really generous, measurements? So uh, I want to get the language right, and I, I love this. Um, maybe for people in Athens, that will remind you of 
old discussions. You know, this is Kepler uh, having discovered that the orbits of planets are elliptical, and then he goes to undoubtedly the uh, the committee that will give him some research grants, and they say, you know, what the hell is an orbit? What the hell is a planet? What the hell is elliptical? So it's important to get the jargon right. And so I'm going to explain where or how I'm going to make my measurements of the black hole masses today. And as I said, it's not complicated at all. Conceptually, it's high school physics, okay? I hope you all remember Newton's law, F equals ma. On the left, we have, uh, I guess, also Newton's law, the law of gravity, which of course, if you're from Oxford like me, you know this isn't Newton's law at all. This should be called Hooke's law since Robert Hooke, who was based at my college, um, discovered it earlier. Uh, and on the right side, we have the centrifugal force. And if we equate these two for, you know, gas or stars moving on perfect circles, in this case, in a spherical potential, we get that the mass is proportional to V square R, where V is the velocity measured at this radius R, right? And when we observe the velocities of galaxies, we get a plot like the one on the right. Um, we see that the velocities of galaxies, in fact, do not vary with radius. It remains pretty much flat over most of the uh, range of the galaxies. Okay, obviously in the center, it's not quite true, but generally flat. Uh, and this, of course, is the main evidence for dark matter, as I'm sure you know, in galaxies, right? So this is an observed fact. So, you know, we have no saying this. This is just how galaxies happen to be. And if we go back to the formula and we say V is a constant, we get that the mass enclosed within a radius R is proportional to R. But of course, if you remember the pictures that I showed you originally of galaxies, the light in the outer parts of galaxies drops very rapidly, right? Galaxies don't become brighter in the outer parts, they get fainter. And so this is the argument for dark matter, right? We have matter in the outer parts that is dark, so we call it dark matter. But we can turn this formula around and make a prediction of what we would see if there was a single mass in the middle. And so then it tells us for a single mass in the middle that the velocity should vary as one over the square root of R. So it should follow roughly this curve. And of course, that's exactly the rotation curve, if you want, of the solar system, right? So you would have Mercury here, Venus, you know, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, and so on and so on, Uranus and Neptune following this. So then the question that we need to ask really is, what would be the expected signal of a galaxy, a galaxy, this curve, with a black hole in the middle, this curve? And of course, what we get is we simply add these uh, curves in quadrature and we get the following. So we get something that should be flat in the outer parts. And then in the inner parts, at some point, starts rising up as one over the square root of R. And it should reach very high velocities. Essentially, this goes more or less to infinity, if you want. Right? Obviously, at some point, you hit the black hole itself. Um, but this just keeps going up. Apologies. I'm having a problem with these buttons. Um, so the signature that I will be looking for today is exactly this, is this curve turning off and increasing uh, towards uh, the center of the galaxies very quickly, rather than remaining flat or going towards zero. And if you see this, and if it goes as one over square root r, you know that what you have there is essentially a point mass, or certainly a mass that is smaller than your highest resolution element of your measurement, right? Proving that it's a black hole is, is another kind of step, but it's certainly the easiest explanation. Now, why is this difficult? The, the reason it's difficult is because in this plot here, I have actually cheated, okay? This rise that I'm showing you, if this were a real curve, would entirely be contained within one pixel of the screen here. So this rise occurs very, very, very close to the black hole. So it's, it becomes not a conceptual challenge to measure a black hole. Conceptually, it's easy. As I said, it's high school physics. It becomes a technological challenge to be able to resolve, so to make measurements so close to the middle of the galaxies with high enough resolution. And the reason this is difficult, of course, is because we're on Earth and we're looking through the atmosphere. So uh, as I'm sure you know, again, from uh, high school, maybe first year university physics, the diffraction limit of a telescope goes as the wavelength divided by the aperture of that of that telescope or, or the size of the aperture. And the theoretical prediction is it should look something like this on the right, right? The so-called airy disk, this is a sink square function, the typical diffraction pattern of light going through an aperture. 
But what you see in practice from the ground, at least at optical wavelengths, is what we see here at the bottom. So what you see at the bottom is a video of a bright star in the sky in real time. So if you stick a video camera at the end of a big telescope, this is actually what you see when you look at a star. And of course, what you see here is light passing through different cells of the atmosphere with different temperatures and densities, and therefore different indices of refraction. And so you do not reach anywhere near the diffraction limit with a telescope from the ground, right? Um, and so if you want to reach that diffraction limit, you have, you know, a few options, but the main two is use what we call adaptive optics. So adaptive optics, I'll explain in a second, is a way to remove the impact of the atmosphere to reach the diffraction limit. And the other one is to use interferometry, where um, instead of D being the size of a single telescope, it becomes a distance between two telescopes, two or more telescopes. And both of these methods, of course, have been used to make uh, high precision, high resolution images of the sky. So here we see um, adaptive optics in action. This is a picture or a movie of one of the two Gemini telescopes. So Gemini, they are twins, right? One in the north, one in the south. This is a telescope operated by the US, Canada, and the UK primarily. Um, and you see here the telescope itself, and we will see light coming through, hitting the primary mirror at the bottom, then reflecting on the secondary here, back into a hole in the primary mirror, and this is where he, we put the actual instruments that dissect the light and that allow us to make measurements. Um, and uh, here, for example, you're going to have one instrument with adaptive optics. And what the adaptive optic does is essentially corrects the wave front going through the atmosphere that is therefore deformed and makes it flat again, right? So we will see here the wave front coming in and we will see uh, that it is deformed, which is why you get this crap image of a star. And then uh, we will sample this deformation of the wavefront. And then we put a mirror in the path, which is deformable itself. So obviously, if you deform the mirror in the opposite direction, after light reflects, the wavefront will be corrected. So you see here corrupted wavefront reflecting on this deformable mirror. And after that, the wavefront are flat. And this is when we get an improvement in the quality of the image. And so this is adaptive optics in practice. Of course, it's quite challenging technically, um, but this is how uh, the measurements of the black hole in the center of the, our own Milky Way were done. Certainly this is how they're done these days. Um, and what you can see on the left is a movie made over a period of, I forget, something like 15 years. Uh, and they're just a succession of images of the galactic center uh, taken every few months, every uh, once in a while. And we will follow a few of the stars moving. And you can see, of course, that the stars are changing their direction very abruptly for no reason whatsoever, right? The best example is this star here that will come out of the, of the top left, the star that I'm following, makes a total U-turn. So here, when you see this, of course, you have always two options, right? One option is that we don't understand the physics, right? <laughs> physics is different in the center of the Milky Way as it is elsewhere. And that's an okay uh, idea to follow. Maybe you should uh, make sure you have a permanent job before you follow it, but it's okay, right? And the other theory, of course, is that gravity is just as we know it, but there is a mass there that we simply don't see. And that, of course, is the supermassive black hole theory. And in fact, we can explain the orbits of the stars. In fact, we'll see here their 3D reconstructions by postulating the existence of a black hole, in this case, of about... 4.6 million solar masses, so about 4.6 million times the mass of our own sun. And if we do that, we can explain the orbits of the stars uh, perfectly. In fact, the ones that go very close, we need to use GR to explain the orbits. Newtonian mechanics is not enough. But that is only through very, very true, uh, very, very close to the black hole. Uh, and of course, this is what was at the origin of uh, uh, the most recent Nobel Prize in Physics for Astronomy, which was the Nobel Prize given to uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Goetz for their observational work, so creating these pictures that I've shown, uh, and Roger Penrose, who's actually at my college uh, at Wadham, for the prediction that black holes are, or it's work that shows that black holes are robust prediction of general relativity. Uh, so it got him a, a portrait on the wall of the dining hall. 
Uh, so the other technique that I talked about is interferometry, whereby we connect several telescopes together. Uh, and for technical reasons, it's easiest to do this actually at long wavelengths where we can digitize the signal so we can take the light and create an electronic signal that records not only the intensity, but also the phase of the signal, which of course is crucial if you want to interfere signals, right? You need to measure the phase. So every pair of antennae creates one baseline, we call it. And then you get essentially N square baselines if you have N telescopes. Uh, and <clears throat> so these telescopes, they mimic, they synthesize, therefore the name, a much larger telescope with a field aperture. Uh, and so what we see here is such a telescope where the antennae are in a straight line. And as the Earth rotates, they fill this synthetic aperture, right? So as the Earth rotates, you're like filling up your, your, your telescope, if you want, your mirror, if you want to call it this way. Right, And so the quality of the image improves as this line makes a full half circle uh, over 12 hours. And this is a picture of a supernova remnant. And the natural resolution here would be very poor, but by using interferometry, you can see the size of the small dots is essentially the resolution uh, of these images. The several kind of circles that you see here are all artifacts of this method, but they're well understood. So we can essentially remove and uh, you know, correct for those appropriately. And this is the method that I'll be using today. But in fact, it has been used. I'm sure you've seen these spectacular pictures of the black hole, both uh, in the big elliptical galaxy M87 and also uh, of the picture in our own uh, Milky Way. This is the Event Horizon Telescope work. So they use telescope located across continents. You can see here the baselines with telescope in the South Pole, in Chile, in Hawaii, in the American Southwest, or Greenland, and, and Europe. Um, and the fact that the baselines here are so large allows them to reach this incredible resolution. So these are actually images. So interestingly, uh, while these, you know, these images are spectacular, they're not very good at constraining the mass. And that's because they're purely images. They do not reveal motion. They don't do spectroscopy. Um, so what I'll do today myself is I'll use baselines that are much shorter from a telescope that is entirely contained in Chile. But I will be doing spectroscopy, which will allow us to derive actually more accurate measures of the black hole masses. Um, so, so this is the method. And maybe before I move on, I'll just pause and ask if, if there's any question on this, just to make sure that the basic uh, is right. So are there, are there any questions or? It's fine, Martin, I'll go on. Okay. Um, so, you know, if we want to apply the high school physics I talked about uh, here, of course, this assumes that the material moves in circular motion. That wouldn't be true of stars, for example, generally. But it is true of cold gas that dissipates and always ends up in the disk. And so the cold gas indeed dissipates energy. Let's say if these were the orbits of various gas blobs over time, they will settle in a disk and move roughly, maybe not exactly, but roughly in circular motions. In theory, they could have slightly elongating, uh, but uh, non-intersecting uh, orbits. So here I'm gonna show the first measurement of a black hole we did, which you know is nowhere near as good as what we're doing these days, uh, but will give you a flavor of what is needed. So what you see in the top right is a galaxy with the beautiful name of NGC 4526. It lives in the Virgo cluster of galaxies, which is essentially the closest cluster of galaxies that we have. And if I zoom in the center of the galaxy with the Hubble Space Telescope, I see the picture in the top left. And when I see this, I'm really happy because although it's full of stars, which are the yellow colors here, uh, I can see what we call dust. So the black lines that you see here are small solid particles. Um, and uh, I know, and, and what you can see is that these small solid particles seem to be moving on circles, right? So this is just an inclined disk and a disk that is circular, but highly inclined to the line of sight. Uh, and we know that when there is dust, there's a lot of molecular gas. So there's very cold gas uh, that we can observe with the ALMA telescope. So when I see this, I'm very happy. And in fact, about a decade ago, we actually imaged this, uh, actually more than a decade ago, for other reasons. And this is what the picture looks like. So this is a picture of carbon monoxide, so CO molecule. Frankly, I couldn't care less that it's carbon monoxide. It's just the brightest molecular line typically in galaxies. Okay, so I just use it 
because it's bright and therefore relatively easy to observe. Now, the, the ellipse here on the bottom right is the resolution of this. So you can see that the resolution here is very poor. Now, this was done with a telescope called Karma uh, that has different modes. And so I'm going to show you what happens if we do two things. So we increase the frequency, so decrease the wavelength. And remember, the angle is lambda over d. So if I decrease lambda, I get a better resolution. And I'm going to increase d as well by literally physically moving the telescopes farther away from each other. Okay, so you pick them, you put them on a truck, and you drive them farther away. Uh, and this is what happens when you do this. So this is amazing, right? This is just a better, essentially, I've put better spectacles on. So this is the same galaxy observed with the same molecule, well, actually very similar, different transition. And now the resolution here is about 20 parsec. So each of the blobs that you see here is a spatially resolved giant molecular cloud. So like a, like the Orion Nebula, let's say. Right? So it's a, all, each blob is a small region of star formation. And you can see that uh, it is clearly an inclined disk and the stuff is probably moving roughly in a circle. In fact, I can measure this because we measure the Doppler shift of the line. And very importantly, there is material in the very center near the black hole. So here is a zoom. And now I'm going to measure the velocities along this axis. What you get out of this type of telescope is actually not an image. It's a data cube. So at each point on the sky, you get a spectrum. OK, so what I show here is just the sum along the wavelength direction. But I can, of course, measure the position of this line in wavelength and therefore infer a velocity. And this is what I get here. So what you see in these three plots is position versus velocity. So it's exactly the same plot I showed you before with the red curve in the galaxies. In orange uh, is the, the actual data. It's the same thing in the three panels. And in black, I overlay a model of this where I've taken the stellar mass of the galaxies of the galaxy and inferred how the gas should be moving if it were moving on circles. And you can see on the left, this is a model. And you can see the model doesn't explain at all the high velocities. And that's because that model has no black hole in it. It has only the stars. On the right side is a model with an overweight black hole, where I've just cranked the black hole mass much more than in reasonable. And you can see then that the model, the model overshoots. So what I need to do to measure the black hole mass in this galaxy is simply turn the dial of the black hole mass until I get a decent fit, right? And that's the plot in the middle. And it says that the mass is roughly 400 million times the mass of the sun. Okay, so that's 100, 100 times more massive than the black hole in the Milky Way. And um, so, so, so you know, that's, that's what the method is. In this case here, of course, this was done uh, with a previous generation of telescopes about 10 years ago, just as a proof of concept. And so we couldn't really resolve very well this rise of the velocity, as I mentioned before. We had essentially one beam on one, one resolution element in this entire region. But this allowed us to show that these measurements are possible, and it gave us a recipe to go and make more measurements with the next generation of telescope which actually is, is available now. So that's what I'm using these days. And I'm going to show this to you in a second. So the recipe is easy. We identify promising galaxies from Hubble Space Telescope images. And by promising, I mean galaxies where we see dust lanes in the inner parts and where the dust seems to be relaxed and well-behaved and moving on circles. We then quantify how much molecular gas there is in those galaxies. And if there is enough, then we go and we, we get the data. And it's important often to take a kind of intermediate measurement. These are maps here of molecular gas on top of the stars, just the molecular gas. And this is the velocity field. So this is how the gas is rotating. Red for red shifted, blue for blue shifted. There so is usually... a question, if we can interrupt you for a while. Yeah. Uh, a question so, from the audience so, here. Do you assume that the, the orbits are circles? So you have a disk down to something like 50 parsecs. It's not a circular isotropic distribution of orbits. It's circular. I mean, yeah, because they're, you they're know, even on a plane. Yeah, so don't forget, we're not talking about stars now where they could be buzzing around in every direction without colliding. We're talking about fairly diffuse gas. So the gas typically dissipates energy and settles in the disk. I'll, I'll, I'll show this to you later. Okay. Um, and um, in fact, we can 
we can self-diagnose if you want, if these assumptions, okay, at the moment I've called this an assumption, but we can verify that it's true in the objects we observe. And occasionally we get objects that are more messy and then we just chuck them out and we don't use them for measurement. It's very interesting to me, I'm not an expert. So this uh, gas, this goes down to a few tens of parsecs as a disk all the way to the center. That's very interesting. Yeah, actually, so when we, so the, the history, if you want, is I've given you a justification of why we do this, but the way it happened in historically is that we were imaging these disks as much lower resolution just to quantify the gas content of these galaxies. And then we realized that the disk were very regular, even in the inner parts. So we just thought, well, let's check if it keeps regular all the way down. And it turns out generally it does. Um, so all yeah. the stars are moving around uh, isotropically in some sense. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, the stars are tiny, right? Yes, 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 I understand. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so the stars would be moving through the, this disk all the time. Absolutely. Well, I'll show you um, velocity fields, if you want, later, that are actually amazingly regular. Um, in fact, the velocity dispersion in these disks is typically, you know, a few kilometers per second, one, two, three, four, five, maybe 10. But the rotation velocities can be easily 400. So energetically speaking, the random motion is only one part in 10,000. So these disks are essentially perfectly cold, dynamically speaking. Yeah. Um, okay, and that's the ALMA telescope that, that I use. This is really the instrument that we need to be doing this. Um, just to give you an idea, this measurement here that I talked about, it took us about 100 hours of observing time on the KARMA telescope, which is this telescope here on the bottom right. And that was the best 100 hours of the entire year, weather-wise. And this telescope is near Death Valley in California. So it's pretty good weather to start with. But to do this measurements, we needed essentially the best 100 hours of the entire year. With ALMA, which is a telescope we currently use, we can make that measurement in two minutes any time of the year, right? So it's it's more than two orders of magnitude improvement. It's, it's amazing. ALMA is just an amazing machine. And this is because it has many antennae. It has about 66 antennae. And it sits at 5,000 meters in the Atacama Desert in the summit of the Andes. So new technology, larger collecting area, broader bandwidth, better sight, right? So it's an amazing, uh, it does come with a pretty a pretty big uh, build, uh, but, but it works. Um, and these were examples of the predictions we made of what we would see already several years ago. We're now in cycle 10. So this was what we thought we would see about seven years ago. For very massive galaxies, this is again this rotation curve, if you want, position versus velocity. The blue line here is the prediction of a galaxy without a black hole in the middle. The orange is the prediction of the galaxy with the black hole. And the name of the game, if you want to measure black hole masses, is to tell the difference between the orange line and the blue line. So, you know, I could ask the audience, can you tell the difference between the orange line and the blue line? Right? A primary school kid could do that. So in the most massive galaxies, doing these measurements is trivial, as long as you get the data. In more normal galaxies, the difference is still large, but, you know, you, you need to work a little bit. While in dwarf galaxies, where the black hole masses are, are very small, uh, it's still very difficult. Okay, so we have very few dwarf galaxies where we've successfully done this. Uh, it's still a lot of work. Um, okay, so here's what is probably our best measurement to date, already published, what, three years ago now. Um, so this is a big elliptical galaxy uh, fairly nearby, about 40 megaparsecs away, I think. Um, and the, the galaxy here shown is blue. And what you see in red is this huge radio jets that I was saying are emanating from the black holes, okay? And if we zoom in, this is an optical picture of the galaxy. And you can see these uh, dark lanes in the middle. So again, if we take a picture with a Hubble Space Telescope and we massage it a bit, here's what we see. And again, when I see this, I'm very happy because it's telling me that this galaxy is full of molecular gas. It is very well behaved, right? The question we had before is, it's kind of surprising that these disks are so well behaved. These are huge radio jets coming out, but they're clearly not coming out through the disk. They're clearly coming out, you know, maybe perpendicular at a significant angle to the disk. 
and we'll see that the velocity field of this disk is, is essentially perfect. So what you see at the bottom is the prediction of what we thought we would see. So again, blue without a black hole, orange with a black hole. And here is what we actually saw. So this is on the left is a, a picture of, of, of that central region of the galaxy. And the molecular gas is exactly where we expected it to be, right? Exactly where the dust is. And this is a velocity field of this galaxy. Again, blue, blue shifted, red, red shifted. So this disk is in rotation. It is extremely well behaved. We can tell that there is no strong non-circular motions by looking essentially at the green line here, which is a velocity of zero. Um, and if there were substantial non-circular motion, this green line would be tilted. It wouldn't be perpendicular to the disk here, okay? It would be tilted at an angle. So, so we can kind of diagnose that the non-circular motions are very small. Um, and in fact, here I can see by eye that there's a black hole in this galaxy because you can see that the velocities are turning over in the very central parts, right? This blue becomes pale blue, but suddenly rises again quickly in the middle. So let's look again at the easier picture to look at. I'll extract the velocities along this line, like, a, like if I were putting a slit. And this is what we see in orange are the data and in blue are models. So you can see that the rotation curve is flat in the outer part as expected, but suddenly it starts rising and it starts rising exactly like one over the square root of R, which is what we expected for a black hole. The model without a black hole, which is shown on the left, fails miserably to reproduce the data. Right? It's totally unable to explain anything we see. In fact, on the right now, I show a model with just a black hole. And you can see that it can uh, explain the inner parts pretty well. Of course, in real life, there's a black hole in stars, and that's the sweet spot in the middle. And uh, this is a very basic picture. We just put gas in a circle, uh, gas moving in a circle with an exponential profile of, of density. Uh, and it fits the data very well. And in this case, so by the way, this is my high school prediction of what we would see. The only difference was it actually doesn't drop that much. It starts going up straight away here. And we infer a black hole mass in this case of about 4 billion times the mass of the sun. Okay, so another factor of 10 compared to the previous galaxy. Um, and here, the error bars actually, we boost them. We, if we were to do a normal uh, MCMC, so Monte Carlo Markov chain analysis of our er errors, essentially the error bars would be zero, would be less than 1%. So we don't really trust this. So I don't want to get in a whole debate about, you know, Bayesian statistics and so on, but these are boosted in a way that makes them a bit more trustable. In fact, we have acquired now even better data of this galaxy about two years ago, now at a resolution of 10 parsec. And this is now what we see. Uh, and essentially now most of the data that you see here is within what we call the sphere of influence of the black hole. So this is the region of the galaxy where the potential of the black hole dominates is more important than that of all the rest of the stars. So this is really essentially the accretion disk around the black hole. And now we're really seeing this. You can see a perfect one over square root R increase. And we start picking up, you know, interesting maybe motions or disturbances uh, in this disk uh, in the very center of the galaxy, right? So this all within one or two arc seconds of the center, right? So this, the, the resolution you get from the ground, essentially you would get two points across this, this, um, this plot. So this is, allows us to both improve the mass measurement, but mostly now we can start probing the dynamics of these accretion disks, if that's what you want to call them uh, here. In fact, in this case, we start picking up slight non-circular motions uh, in, in this object. Um, and, and this is, we're, we're just finishing to write this paper up. Um, so this is very exciting. In fact, we are starting, because ALMA is now at its full power, to get more galaxies like this where we resolve the sphere of influence very well. I should say here, across the black hole sphere of influence, we have about 30 independent resolution elements. So it's amazing. This has never really been done before. Uh, this is another object. This is, again, an optical picture of the galaxy. Here in red is the molecular gas overlay. That's exactly where you expect it to be following the dust lanes. And again, these are the position velocity diagrams of the rotation curves. 
and you can see this incredible rise, like one over square root r, uh, in the inner parts. So position, velocity. In the left, again, a model without the black hole, and you can see that the, the lines in blue that are the model do not reproduce the data at all. Uh, on the right is what would be an overweight black hole, just for comparison. And in the center is the sweet spot. This is our best fit model, so our measurement, if you want, where we can reproduce uh, this rise very, very well with essentially barely any assumption. We just put an exponential disk of material moving on circles, and we have two free parameters, well, two important ones, the black hole mass and the mass to light ratio of the stars, which allows us to transform an image of the stars into a mass. And that's pretty much it. There, there's no other physics in there. And again, uh, in this case, 3 billion solar masses. Um, so this is very, very promising. Here we see our record holder uh, in terms of low black hole masses, not highest, but lowest. So um, I always ask people, so, you know, what do you think the resolution of this image is? Uh, and every good radio astronomer knows that the beam, so the resolution is always shown in the bottom left corner of these plots. And it is here, it's that little black dot here. And our resolution in this case is half of one parsec. This is actually a dwarf galaxy near the Milky Way. And the entire image that you see here is essentially a single molecular cloud, the size of a single molecular cloud. It's about 80 parsec, parsecs across. We have a resolution of about half of one parsec, and we infer a black hole mass, in this case, of less than one million solar masses. We're kind of pushing towards this regime of intermediate mass black holes. Okay, we're not quite there, but we're starting to push. Um, you know, I remind you that the distance between the sun and the closest star is over one parsec. So if these were data of stars, every star would be seen separately and we would get the motion of every star independently, okay? So incredible resolution. So these are examples of the measurements we're currently making and we're now starting to kind of chug them out, you know, at, at a good pace. Um, there's probably from our group published now, I'm not sure, well published or fully written up maybe a further 10 black hole masses. Uh, and probably a similar number by other groups. So, um, you know, we're going to really transform these studies of the black hole mass galaxy properties correlations uh, by essentially replacing these 100 poorly measured black hole masses I measured at the beginning by now, hopefully, an equal number, maybe more, much more accurately measured black hole masses using a single method across this entire range of galaxies. So there are also interesting spin-offs that are coming from that. And in fact, I found myself over the years having to argue why using this method is so uh, so good, so important, so you know superior, if you want, to other methods. And of course, the gold standard, as I mentioned in the beginning, is mazes. So now I was thinking of a way to compare our measurements to those of mazes, and I realized actually that no matter which metric you use to compare this, our measurements are just as good already as those of Mazur's. And I'm gonna to try to explain why now. So if we go back again to our high school physics, right? So G GMM over R square equals MV square over R. Um, if we think as physicists, we should always want to use dimensionless quantities, right? So I'm gonna normalize the radius here by the Schwarzschild radius, which is the kind of reference radius if you talk about black hole. And I'm going to normalize the velocities by the velocity of light. And if you do this and you rewrite this equation, you get the following. The mass disappears, essentially. So you get that V squared goes as 1 over R. Um, and then you get this term, which is the mass within a radius R, divided by the black hole mass. So of course, if you're within the black hole sphere of influence, this is one, this ratio is one, right? The mass of the stars is not important, so the black hole dominates. So you get the formula at the bottom. So what this is saying is no matter which tracer you use, whether you use you know, ionized gas, molecular gas, mazes, if you're in that region where the black hole dominates, all the data should lie in this very simple relation that is independent of the black hole mass, right? So V squared goes as one over R. If V is normalized by C, and the radius is normalized by the Schwarzschild radius. So in those units, you get a very simple parallel relation with a slope of one half. So let's see if our measurements follow this. 
And in fact, they do. So this is the prediction of this of this relation. The MASER measurements are in red, so they're the red data points, all the published MASER measurements so far, and you can see that they follow this relation perfectly. And the molecular gas measurements that we've done over the last few years are plotted in blue. And you can see that the smallest radius or the highest velocities, they also follow this relation very well. But once you start going further out, they start to deviate. And that actually is expected because that's when this term here is not negligible. So if you go beyond the sphere forms of the black hole, the mass of the stars starts to be important. And in fact, these different curves, or, or essentially the prediction, when you not only have a black hole, but you have stars in those galaxies and for kind of different galaxies, different so-called search models. And you can see that our observations of the molecular gas, they deviate in exactly the expected manner at large radii, if you want. Um, and this, by the way, this point here is the measurement of the black hole in the Milky Way, where uh, it's the star that moves closest to the black hole that we've plotted here. And of course, the star need not move on a perfect circle, and that's probably why it's slightly off, right? Because its orbit is actually elliptical rather than circular. Um, and the, this little sign point here is, is this latest measurement I've shown of this galaxy that we're just about to publish, which actually is better than all of those of Mazes. So this this plot gives us a kind of way to gauge both the both if our measurement is reliable because sorry it, my cursor keeps disappearing uh, both if a measurement is reliable it should lie on this and also how well we're doing in terms of probing close to the black hole okay so we're unlikely to ever reach of course you, you know as close to the black hole as we do in the Milky Way because we're in the Milky Way it's very close but we're doing pretty well right this is not even two orders of magnitude where it's kind of what one and a half orders of magnitude or something like that. Um, however, some people have argued that this plot is, is a bit artificial. It's purely physical quantities. Here I can normalize in a different way that is more related to the ability of the observations to make a good measurement. So now I have the same high school relation at the top, but I normalize by what people usually take to be the sphere of influence of black hole. So that's our sphere of influence which is GM black hole over sigma square. And the sigma is the velocity dispersion of the stars. Okay, so when people do stellar measurement, that's the kind of quantity they compare to. And if I normalize, apologies again, if I normalize this relation, now I get a very similar relation. V square goes as one over R, but now V is normalized by the velocity dispersion of the stars and here by the sphere influence of the black hole. But again, all the measurements lie on, on the same curve. The maser measurements very well, the molecular gas measurements very well for the best measurements, but they start to depart uh, for, for the measurements that are not so good. Uh, and here I must admit that the masers do better than us generally still in, in, in this metric. Um, we can use another metric, which is, I believe, better, which is to say where actually exactly is the mass of the black hole equal to the enclosed mass of the stars. This is really physically what we mean by the sphere of influence of a black hole, right? If I start going from the center and I start adding up the stars, where is the mass and stars equal to that of the black hole in the middle? And this is the third metric that I've used. Uh, so we define the equality radius, which is that radius where the stars are equal to the black hole, and the velocity at that point. And I get, again, the same kind of relation, V squared is one over R, but just normalized by these different quantities. And again, all the measurements lie on it. Now I can only plot the molecular gas measurements because to do this, you need a mass model of the galaxy itself. And when the maser people do their measurement, they just ignore the stars. They just don't, they just don't put the stars at all. They just assume there's a black hole in the middle. So I'm not able to put the maser measurements on this, except one, it's just one galaxy happens to have a measurement and it lies perfectly on the relation as expected. So this is very interesting because what this is telling us is that our measurements using molecular gas are already just as good. And in fact, they probe the same region as the mazes, right? If I go back to my first here normalization, you can see that the velocity that you measure, that's the innermost point in your curve, tells you how close you are to the black hole in terms of Schwarzschild radius. So there's a unique relationship between the rotation velocity 
and how close you are in terms of number of Schwarzschild radii. And the fact that the mazes and the molecular gas measurements live in the same part of the diagram tell us that they physically probe the same regions of the disk, right? So the difference, of course, is in ALMA, this takes minutes to do. Uh, mazes take uh, hours and hours, difficult to get telescope time. Mazes is only detected in about 1% of galaxies. All galaxies have molecular gas in them, or nearly all. So really, I think the way of the future is this molecular gas method. Um, so I wanted to make, a, if it's OK, uh, maybe to go for one or two more minutes. Sure. Um, okay. Is that okay, Panos? Yes, 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 go on. Okay. So for those of you who are interested in active galactic nuclei, or AGN, uh, we, we've got a, an interesting result that is not published yet, but we've put on the archive. And it's spurred by this very simple realization that the black hole masses that we measured uh, are also very well correlated with the luminosity at millimeter wavelengths. And now I'm not talking about the luminosity of the molecules, like the CO molecules I was measuring, but the continuum emission in these galaxies, whose origin is actually a little bit unclear, but it's very trivial to measure, right? Because it's continuum, so we have broad bandwidth. It's an easy measurement to make. And what you see here is all the galaxies with the black hole mass measured, actually measured from dynamics, versus a continuum in lost. And you can see a very good correlation, which is nearly as good as the M sigma relation. So the scatter here uh, interesting, is about 0.4, while the M sigma is about 0.3. So it's not quite as good, but nearly. Um, <clears throat> but the key is this becomes a very powerful proxy of black hole masses because measuring the x-axis here is easy and very quick. Uh, it can literally be done, actually, it, it, with Alma, you can do that in seconds. Um, so what is more interesting as well is um, if we just plot stellar mass black holes on this relation, they seem to follow. So this is just the same relation as before, just extrapolated. And here we have put uh, X-ray binaries, <clears throat> so stellar mass black holes, and they seem to follow the relation as well. So this is, some of you may know about something called a fundamental plane of black hole accretion, which is something that was discovered in the radio. So this is an equivalent in the millimeter. But the reason it's important will become apparent in a second. So now I've moved from a plane, sorry, which was black hole mass versus millimeter, to black hole mass versus some combination of millimeter and X-ray emission. And the, the radio fundamental plane, as it's called, would have the same, except here would be luminosity in the radio. So you could say, if you want to be cynical, well, it's just the same as the radio fundamental plane. Uh, you know, it's not surprising. But it is this correlation that is extremely tight, much tighter than the radio one, and nearly as tight as the M sigma relation. And what is more interesting is that we can put all kinds of active galactic nuclei on this, and they all follow the same relation. So here I've added the so-called Bass sample, which is really uh, high luminosity AGN, if you want high excitation AGN, rather than our galaxies that were just essentially normal galaxies. And in gray are so-called ADAF models, so advection-dominated accretion flows, which is one flavor of uh, accretion disk models. And you can see that the ADAF models, they reproduce all of this. What is interesting is that the classical model of a thin accretion disk and tori doesn't fit those data at all. Um, yeah, so at the same point that the stellar mass black holes live on the same relation, and here is millimeter versus X-ray, uh, our galaxies are here in blue. Uh, the Bass sample are here in, in red, orange color. In black is a grid of model from ADAP, so advection-dominated accretion flows, while here is where the traditional you know, thin disk with uh, torus models lie. And you can see that these models do not reproduce the data at all. So not only have we found a new correlation, if you want, for black holes, uh, not only does it provide a very powerful proxy of black hole masses, but in fact, it turns out it probably provides a very strong constraint on the nature of the emission and therefore of the accretion in active galactic nuclei, because essentially all these models here that many people rely on just don't fit the data at all. While ADAFs that were thought to be uh, appropriate only for these blue dots here seem to reproduce all kinds of AGNs. 
uh, in this case, not only the, the low luminosity ones. So that's something we're starting to explore, as well as the connection, of course, with the stellar mass black hole that tells you that there's something pretty fundamental and kind of scale-free in the accretion physics around massive objects. Um, so that's it. Um, I, I'll stop here uh, and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions around, then uh, we can start from the audience if we, uh, uh, there are questions here. Let, let me ask you first something. Uh, the Like the, uh, the, the the plot that you have with the rotation curve uh, here to the left, uh, this abrupt rising uh, can only be attributed to the presence of a black hole of a point mass in the center of the galaxy, or you can start using uh, some uh, kind of bulges uh, with a small scale length, maybe. Uh, 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 well, if you can answer that, and then I can I will follow. Yeah. With... So, so the bulges here, if they observe in the light, they are already taken into account, right? So we take, literally, we model the stellar light and we turn it in a mass model. So, so that's already taken into account. What, of course, does give you more freedom is to adopt a variable so-called mass-to-light ratio, right? The default assumption is you have the light, you multiply by a magic number, you get the mass. So um, so we do explore variable mass-to-light ratio models in the papers. Um, in fact, in some galaxies, we must have it because, in fact, you know, the, the flat part here, you know, for example, where my cursor is, that's entirely due to the stars. Yes. And often... If we adopt a fixed mass to light ratio, we cannot even fit that region properly. Okay. Right? So we must introduce a gradient that we then extrapolate, if you want, all the way to the center. So that increases the uncertainty on the black hole mass a little bit. But what we find is that if you wanted to get rid of the black hole, if you want, by having you know a variation of mass to light ratio, that variation would have to be really, really extreme. And we, we don't know of any stellar populations that behave like this. So then it becomes a bit of a choice. You know, <clears throat> a black hole, of course, is just an extreme mass to light ratio, right? Yes. It's adding mass without adding light. So yes, we can always fit the data with having an extreme variation of the mass to light ratio. But then the question becomes, you know, what, what is the physical reason between, be, behind that change? <laughs> yeah. And the easiest oh, explanation well, is the well, intuitively, if you see something that is not on the y-axis, let's say, and then here I don't know what is the scale, but uh, we have here uh, arc seconds. Uh, I have seen in another uh, uh, plot that this could be, let's say, of the order of tens of parsecs. Then, uh, you can fit rotation curves with a, a heavy bulge component without having a black hole in the middle. And oh, but that's already there. The, the bulge is already there. Yeah. Well, okay. It's already uh, taken well, into account okay, for the specific galaxy, but in general, I'm speaking to have this kind of uh, uh, rotation curve in the inner part. You can do that uh, without a point mass, with an extended object. So th th that's my question. So if you have a, a, a bulge with a very small scale length, then you can also fit the the the. the... But, but Panos, what I'm saying is. It's already there because hmm. if it's there, we would see it in our images, right? So it's already there. It's already taken into account. Okay. The only way you could fit these things with what you say is have an invisible bulge of invisible stars. And then I agree. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. but you can as long it. as they emit light, they are already taken into account in our models. And, and gas, I guess, also as well, because we have a lot of gas in the center, right? So that, well, that... So that we, we can put in, if we want, the mass of the molecular gas that we observe, but that's always negligible compared to, you know, the so the, the, the black hole mass here is three times 10 to the nine. Mm -hmm. The amount of gas we're looking at in this plot is probably a few times 10 to the seven. Okay, okay. So it's okay. it's totally negligible. And uh, before asking the colleagues here if they have questions, also another one, what are the best images uh, in terms of resolution of nearby galaxies we, where we have uh, a well, uh, uh, well a, a nice distribution of gas 
observable in uh, in images we can find. So what is the resolution, the best resolution we have? And if there are some, uh, let's say, published work on showing how the gas is distributed in the very center in, in tens of parsecs and less. Well, it depends what kind of gas. Gas can mean many, many things. Oh, yeah, okay, molecular gas, yeah. Well, it would be this. this. These are essentially the best math. I mean, there are, other, so the wisdom team, we've probed, these are probably the highest resolution maps around, right? I, I've, i sorry, I, I've been focusing on the dynamics because that's how we get uh, masses. But so this is, for example, a whole bunch of galaxies that we've looked at. Okay. Um, so the, the map on the left, the velocity field on the right. Yeah. Um, there are, of course, uh, because we're interested in mostly, well, originally early type galaxies, they tend to be farther away. There are other teams that have looked at nearer galaxies. And then, of course, you get a resolution in, in Parsec without pushing ALMA very much, just because they're so near. You don't need a high angular resolution to get a good spatial resolution. So there are many maps in nearby spirals at resolution of a few Parsecs. All the all the usual galaxies you would know, you know, Circinus, NGC two five three, NGC ten sixty eight, uh, of course M thirty one. All these galaxies have maps at a few parsec resolution available. I'm asking that because uh, in the absence of this abrupt raising part of the rotation curves, we have the other kind of without it. Then, according to the standard density wave theory, and as the gas will accumulate towards the center. Uh, models <laughs> expect to see there a kind of uh, leading spiral features. And this is very rare to be observed. I have just a few cases in my mind and I'm think I'm just wondering if one could uh, try to see if uh, in, uh, if there is this uh, uh, predicted, let's say, uh, behavior, between galaxies where you have the abrupt raising file due to black hole, for instance, et cetera, or, and between those galaxies that they do not have, it does go where the rotation curves go smoother towards the uh, flat part. Uh, if we can go in this resolution, this, this is why I'm asking them. Okay, if you if you trace a leading spiral feature, it just struck me alive. Well, I don't know. There's a huge variety in what we see, and you can see that here. That's just nine galaxies there, but there are many more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, okay. Let let me see. There are questions here. Yeah. So maybe. Uh, have you found any examples um, with your method by the fitting the rotation curve of galaxies with uh, heavy bulges that possess no no black hole? Uh, yeah, so two points. So I, I should say, maybe I should, I should say, we don't actually fit the rotation curves. We fit the whole data cube. I've just been showing these plots because it's easier to visualize, but we do fit the three-dimensional data we get from the telescopes. Okay, so we fit X, Y, and lambda, or X, Y, and velocity, just a, an important point because there, there are many more data points than what you see here. That's just the one cut through the cube. Um, but to answer your question about, so we have not found no any galaxies where we don't see a black holes, although we have a few, well, okay. We have a few where we have only an upper limit, but the reason is always because there's a hole in the center. So for example, if we look at the galaxy here, there just happens to be no molecular gas in the center, right? So the first measurement of the velocity we make is quite far out. And at that point, the black hole wouldn't dominate over the stars. So it's very hard to separate the two. So they are, in fact, it's quite common to have very small holes in the molecular gas in the middle. And that's a nightmare for us. And we're trying to understand this as well. But when this happens, there are some objects where we have only an upper limit. But the upper limit in terms of the M sigma relation, uh, you know, the upper limit is not below, which I guess you would be interested in, but is always above the line. So it's not it's not interesting. We have no measurements that lie significant, significant, significantly below the known relation so far. Well, but there are some cases where you have very close to the center a kind of plateau, let's say, or a, mm. a small uh, gas uh, surface density or things like that, or a hole. 
you have cases like that. Yeah, but what the whole, as I just explained, what the whole, what that means, the whole is that the radius where we measure is farther out, mm -hmm. right? So, so we cannot tell the difference between stars and black hole. Okay. So that's why it's an upper limit on the black hole mass. But that upper limit is always above the relation. So it's not interesting, right? It's an arrow pointing down. So it's less than something. But it's not an interesting upper limit. So we do have such measurements. Okay. But that's not telling you there's no black hole. That's telling you you cannot tell. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. yes. uh, just a preliminary question. This XRB data points that you have, I guess you have them in their radio loud phase of their evolution. And we expect to have winds and jets in that phase. So my question is. Do you have any indication in your data that you're seeing outflows from this mo molecular disk that you're finding? Maybe the hole that you just mentioned is an indication of an outflow. I don't. Know. Um, so we don't. Re we haven't really seen much of that in our galaxies. Uh, there are, of course, other galaxies where people have have discovered molecular gas outflows that have been involved in some of those works, um, but of course. There's a little bit of, uh, well, I don't know, it's not a chicken and egg, but you know, if there are strong outflows, then we cannot use the kinematics to measure a black hole mass. So it's kind of almost exclusive, right? If the, if the outflows are so strong that they strongly influence the gas, then we will we'll not be able to use that to make a black hole mass measurement. Yes. So, so in our objects that we've used here, they all have very clean, uh, you know, very clean kinematics because that's what we need to make a measurement. But indeed, there are a few objects where we see clear evidence of molecular outflows. For example, I've been involved with work recently with Ilaria Rafa, uh, who in fact is, is leading the, this paper on the fundamental plane. So this person here, uh, in her thesis, she looked uh, at exactly these issues. And there's, for example, one very good example where we see you know, a, a ring of molecular gas that has two holes, and that's exactly where radio jets comes through. And we even see molecules that are so-called shock traces. So along the edge of this jet, where it, it seems to interact with the molecular gas disk, you see molecules that are created by shocks. So there's clear evidence of outflows in some objects. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. One more question. Quick question, just to clarify. You had the an image of several scales and the, the uh, of that galaxy, I don't remember the name, and you had the picture of Alma of this protostellar disk. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the resolution of the Alma image seems to be much, much higher than the VHS image. Oh, sorry, okay, I'm not sure what... Yeah, the Alma image is not the center of, of, of the HST image, it's just one... Uh, well, so generally, so our resolution, so let's say the HST resolution typically about 0 0.05 arc second. Um, generally, that's better than our resolution, but similar. But in a few cases, indeed, in a few cases, we're now limited by the poor angular resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, we now have objects where we work uh, at, at much higher resolution. You can see, for example, in this data here, that's 0 0.03 arc seconds. Um, the HST resolution typically, you know, is 0 0.05. So okay. it's starting to be a little bit of a problem. And in fact, in the picture, I think you were saying, that's why this line here, if you'd see, is so straight. That's because we, we don't really resolve this region well with the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. By the way, the reason I put uh, this protoplanetary disk here uh, is is just for fun. It's because um, when when I got this picture of this galaxy, I couldn't I couldn't help but be reminded of this Alma press release on HL Tau. I think they look very similar. But has, have nothing to do with each other. Yes. <laughs> okay. But so I walked into the office of uh, our exoplanet people in Oxford, and I said, "Look." And they said, oh, Martin, I didn't know you were studying protoplanetary disks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, you know, now these people give, I don't know if there's some, many talks about the substructure in these protoplanetary disks and the spiral arms and the gaps. And 
or or amazed at this, but I'm find this a little bit anyway funny myself because as Panos knows, we've seen these structures in in Galaxy Disk for decades, um, and you know I think the physics is the same. The main difference, of course, between the pro planetary disk and ours is the shape of the rotation curve, right, or the circular velocity curve. This is exactly one over square root r, presumably over the entire disk. While in our cases, you get the one over square root r in a small region in the center, and then it's flat. But anyway, it's it, it, I should say this is, of course, is a continuum picture, right? While I was showing a, a line picture, the, the CO line. Yeah. OK. So let's see if there are other questions from people that are not in the audience, is someone who wants to ask something? Can I ask something, Panos? Yes, yes, I don't see you. Just, yeah, please go. Okay. okay. Uh, well, thank you for this very, very nice talk. I actually have two short questions. The first is, if there is any pressure gradient across the disk, then the velocities become slightly subkeplerian. Do you have anything like that present or...? Uh, I don't, uh, no clue. The, the answer is I have no clue. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you get a pressure I'm, gradient means that something pushes the material outside. So eventually the curve yeah, changes a bit. I mean, typically in planetary disks, you have that phenomenon, but I don't know if that's something similar. Yeah, so I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure how we could tell because, of course, in our case, essentially we scale the curve until it fits by changing the mass of the object in the middle. So yeah. in your case, I guess you know the mass of the object in the middle and you see that there is a difference between what you predict and what you observe. Yeah, yeah, but that will only depend essentially on the on velocity dispersions. For example, if you had a 10% velocity dispersion, if your velocities were not circular by 10% or something, that could be important. I don't know if you can measure any velocity dispersions down there. Oh, yeah, yeah, so we have full, sorry, I haven't shown them, but we have full velocity dispersion maps. So... Here, I could add a turn map here, which would be the velocity dispersion map mm -hmm. along the line of sight. Uh, and in most objects, it's very, very small. So uh, the order of, let's say, 1% or something? Uh, yeah, 1, 1, 2, 3%, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And the second question is, it's about your last very nice transparencies about the uh the fundamental plane where you add the x rays luminosity with the millimeter luminosities yeah but these are very different wavelengths so it's really surprising is there any any understanding any theory why combining such so different essentially emissions or whatever you get still you get something that seems to be more correlated than with any individual okay. So, so I'm not at all an expert on this. I put it there because I know it would interest some people, but this is really not what I do. Essentially, the X-ray is generally considered a proxy for the accretion rate mm. on the black hole. Um, yeah, so while the millimeter here seems to be tracing the black hole mass, you can see in this plot, uh, the X-ray is along the X-axis and the lines here, this is the Eddington ratio or kind of nearly, not exactly vertical. So the idea is that X-ray is a proxy for accretion. Millimeters can be a proxy for black hole mass quite well, but why that is, I'm not sure. And in the paper, we discuss a little bit the different potential emission mechanism at millimeter, but we, we don't reach any, any conclusion. firm conclusion. We're, we're just not sure. Um, it could be very small jets. I think it could be coming from really the accretion disk itself. Uh, we're we're not sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I don't see there are any other questions. Martin, thank you very very much. It was a great talk. Uh, thank for everything. So and okay. we will be in touch. <laughs> thank you very much. I hope everybody enjoyed. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.